book of Genesis. We'll be finishing up our study in the life of Joseph today. Lesson number 10. Genesis chapter 45. It's been a good study. I've enjoyed it. I hope, I hope it's been a blessing to you. If you uh, forgot, if you would like a Sunday school lesson to follow along with, and you forgot to grab one of those, Brother Dennis Persinger, if you'd hand that out. All right. Thank you for that. Got the microphone on. Appreciate it. So just bring it up if you need one of those. I'm going to bring that down just a little bit. There we go. Is that better? All right. Brother Dennis will hand those out. Thanks to Brother Dennis. All right. Let's find our way to Genesis chapter 45, verse number 16 is where we will begin. Remember that uh, Joseph has revealed himself to his brothers. He said, hey, I'm Joseph. You know, you sold me, but God sent me. You know, God had a higher purpose in mind. And he's worked everything uh, to... God always has a plan. We thought we learned about that uh, last week, is that God is always at work. Sometimes we don't see it. Sometimes we don't know He is. Uh, we don't know what's going on, but He's always at work. He's always working, thing, he's always, uh, working things through our lives uh, to, to guide us in His path. Sometimes we just, we just need to, to get on board with that instead of fighting against it. And Joseph was definitely one who shows us that way. But if you found your way to Genesis chapter 45, verse number 16, let's pick up there. The Bible says, And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come. And it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say unto thy brethren, This do ye, laid your beasts, and go get you unto the land of Canaan. And take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded, this do ye, take, it, take you out wagons out of the land of Egypt, for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. To all of them he gave each man changes of raiment. But to Benjamin he gave three hundred pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. And to his father he sent after this manner ten asses laden with the good things of Egypt, and ten she-asses laden with corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. And they went up out of Egypt, and came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. Our study of the story of Joseph closes as Joseph sends his brothers, laden with gifts and other goods from Egypt, back to Canaan to tell their father the joyous news that Joseph is alive and well. Before the brothers set out, Joseph give them, gives them a final instruction to stay the course. The principles involved in this instruction will help us as we seek to keep living and dreaming for God. Let's pray before we get into this outline and this lesson. Father in heaven, I do pray that you would guide us through this uh, lesson, Lord, that you would help us have open hearts, open minds, and a uh, willingness to receive from your word. Lord, help us to understand the life lessons that you Teach us through the life of Joseph and apply them to our lives. Help us, Lord, to please you in this and to please you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. As we think about the life of, of Joseph, God definitely had a plan. Uh, God had a plan for his life. We know uh, that we started with Joseph dreaming dreams. And he would share his dreams and his brothers wouldn't like that so much because that put them in a place of servitude to him. But remember that back in, in Joseph's days, it wasn't like you had a Bible to read from. The way God revealed himself at this time is, uh, if you study in the scriptures, you see uh, to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob and Joseph, 
was in way different ways than he speaks to us now. And he, he was revealing himself through these dreams to Joseph. And so remember that when Joseph was sharing this dream, he was sharing the word and will of God, if you will. And so for them to re, you know, get mad about it, they weren't just getting mad at Joseph, they were getting mad at God's plan. Uh, all along this way, though, Joseph has kept that vision. He's kept that dream. I admire and I appreciate uh, Joseph in the way that uh, a lot of us, maybe we've had a dream for God before. Maybe we have had that desire. Maybe we've had that thought that this is something I want to do for the Lord someday. And then we have an obstacle in the way or we have a setback and we say, well, I guess that wasn't God's will. We let that setback immediately uh, decide for us that that wasn't the will of God. When in, 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 when in a different way, maybe that was God strengthening us through that to prepare us for what He has for us. And so as we think about that, the life of Joseph, I believe, shows that. Joseph uh, was not a perfect man, but he was a man who sought to live for God no matter what situation he found himself in. And God honored his obedience and faith by using him in amazing ways to impact the world. As I read that statement in the, in the introduction of the lesson and preparing for this, I found that to be such a, uh, it definitely fit with a lot of American Christianity. And I, I've been there, I'm, I'm part of American Christianity, so I'm part of that. At times we'll see, uh, I want to, let me say that while I'm a part of that, I want to go beyond that and just be the Christian that God saved me to be. Not tacking on American or European or African or whatever you want to put before that. I just want to be a Christian. But that goes a lot deeper than the heritage or the traditions that we practice here in the States. I, uh, going back to that, you know, it's easy to serve God when good things are happening, isn't it? Uh, when, when you're up on the mountaintop and you get that raise at work or, or everything's going well at home, everybody's in good health, well, praise the Lord, everything's great. Uh, but when your spouse gets sick or, or your, your parents get cancer or your child uh, gets, you know, gets sick, something like that, are you still going to serve God? When you get laid off at work, are you still going to serve God? When you get in that car accident, uh, are you still going to serve God? This uh, past week, I should have been in a car accident because I'm usually the person, as soon as it turns green, usually I'm the person to hit the gas and go. Uh, I'm in a hurry. I, I, maybe that's an unfortunate thing, but it's just true. For whatever reason, uh, over here on, on uh, Knoxville and Detweiler, it turned green, and uncharacteristically, I waited two seconds as a lady pretty much came halfway into the intersection before I started going. And I thought, oh, well, I appreciate that, Lord. I appreciate you looking out for me that way. But if I had started going and I'd been in that car accident, who knows what would have happened? But had that happened, you still need to serve the Lord. You get what I'm saying? Whatever circumstance you're found in, don't just wait for it to be easy. I was watching a little something about South Korean Christians stuffing plastic water bottles with rice and with uh, tracts and with scripture, and they, uh, sent, they walk into this island that's in this, this river that separates South Korea from North Korea. And North Koreans, uh, the regular everyday citizen there, has to work four days for a little, uh, pretty much, was it like a quart or a liter, I guess they measured it in a liter, a liter of rice, four days to be able to afford that. And so these South Korean Christians were stuffing it with rice and with tech, trying to, to let them know that somebody's out there that loves them. You know, there's, there's North Korean believers that we're never going to know their names because they're going to maybe live and die in a work camp. That's what they have for life right now. They're definitely not experiencing the good things that we experience right now as far as materialistically. But I would be willing to bet that they have a deeper love for the Savior than you and I do. They're trusting Christ in those hard times. And if you're sitting in the pew and you're saying, how dare you challenge my love for the Lord? Well, Forgive me, I guess, but I'm just saying that it's in the hard times that we really grow in Christ. And that's, I, I think if you're living in those hard times and you're staying faithful, you're going to experience some of that growth. Joseph's life was a great example uh, for us about this. 
His, his life was a great example of staying faithful to God in the hard times. And you know what? It's found in the book of Genesis. You say, what's the big deal about that? It's one of the first stories that God wants us to know. He wants us to know that He will be faithful. He wants us to know that our faithfulness will be rewarded. Does that mean that every one of us is going to become the leader of a nation? No, that's not what God's plan is for everyone. That was God's plan for Joseph, but God's plan um, for you might be to be the best mom that you could ever be, be the best dad you could ever be, be the best mechanic you could ever be. Wherever you are, you can serve the Lord. And you can do the best for him. But as we think about uh, the story of God's faithfulness in Joseph's life, I think it's important that we find it in the very first book of the Bible. God's already showing his faithfulness to us. He wants us to know of his faithfulness. Uh, and, and as Joseph sends his brothers away to Jacob, back to Jacob to the promised land, he sends them with a message of hope and a plan. He sends them with a message of hope and a plan. And we come to point number one, follow the plan. Follow the plan. Uh, as we think about Joseph uh, and, and Pharaoh getting together and coming up with a plan, they send them up there and uh, they, desire, uh, they desire them to come leave, leave Canaan land where there's no food, where there's famine, and come down into Egypt where we're prepared, we have food, and you'll live. That's the message of hope. That's the message of hope, uh, and there's a plan behind it. Uh, Christian, we have a message of hope for those who are dying in a starving famine land. Uh, I don't mean a famine of food and, and clothes and technology and materialism. I mean in spiritual famine. Outside, uh, we know people who don't know Christ. We know people who claim to know Christ, but it's evident in their life they don't know the Jesus of the Bible that I know. Or they're deceived in, in false doctrine. And, and we, uh, we're called to tell them a message of hope, the message of Christ. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter 14, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also." Understand that uh, God's plan is for us to be with Him for all eternity. He goes to prepare a place. He says that where I am, there ye may be also. That's the purpose of the plan. Joseph was saying to Jacob and to all of his family, the purpose behind this plan is for you to come where I am. Remember that Joseph is a picture of Christ. Uh, there's a lot of things that we've uh, walked through week by week and seen uh, in the life of Joseph, and also see, we see those things uh, as illustrations. They also happen in the life of Christ. There are pictures that way. And as we think about uh, this picture of redemption, Joseph wants them to know there is hope here. There's, there's life here. You need to come. Uh, follow the plan. Letter A, tell of my glory. What was to be done? It said, and you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and all that you have seen, and you shall haste and bring down my father hither. Understand that Joseph had the desire and the position to save. You say, well, why in the world would you want... That's just so... Uh, he's just such a braggart. He wants everybody to go tell his dad about all of his glory. No, what was he saying is, I am able to help you. Uh, I'm in a position where I can help the family. If Joseph had just been some slave down there and it got word back to Jacob, I'm, maybe that would lighten Jacob's heart a little bit as far as, hey, my son's not dead, but then what? There's not a whole lot you can do from there, but Joseph is saying, hey, I have both the, the desire to save my family. Remember that uh, 10 of those in that family, the brothers, had sold him into slavery, were, were going to kill him, but then sold him into slavery. Uh, yet Joseph, remember, he forgave and he said, not only do I want to forgive, but I want to go over and above that. Uh, and I want to provide a place where all the family can live and thrive. And so when he says, tell him of my glory, he's saying, listen, I have the desire and the position to save. Can I tell you, we have a great Savior who has both the desire and the position to save and redeem lost mankind. 
He has the desire uh, to save, and he has the position to save. As we think about uh, the day that we're celebrating, today in uh, we're, we're celebrating Resurrection Sunday of those 2,000 years ago when, when they came to the empty tomb and found there was no one there because Jesus had risen. And he has that desire to share the gospel, share that message with a lost and dying world. And he has the position. He is the Savior. He's the God of all the universe. And he says, I can save you. I want you to be with me. He has that position. Uh, in Philippians chapter 2, if you'll turn there with me. Philippians chapter 2. Uh, keep, keep a bookmark if you do that sort of thing there in Genesis. But in Philippians chapter 2, we read of God's plan. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says in chapter 2 verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God uh, the Father. That last part speaks of position, but did you catch what happened before that? Jesus became the servant. You see, excuse me, Jesus had to become the servant to be the Savior. He had to humble himself and be obedient even to the death of the cross to carry out God's plan. I cannot imagine, uh, we think about, uh, we we think about uh, tough guys, you know, uh, you don't, you can, you can be mad at me for it or whatever if you want. I know some super spiritual Christians don't like the UFC or boxing, but I, those guys are some talented individuals, some of them, and there's what, what they can do as far as how they, they know how to do all these mixed martial arts and all that, I enjoy watching some of that. And as I was watching some of that uh, recently on a best 25 fights of all time or something, I was thinking, man, those guys are tough. And all these things that they can do. But then I really started thinking about this, about the toughness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, what do you mean? All those fighters would say, oh man, could say, oh, if he was tough, he would have fought them all off. He would have beat them. But how much more strength does it take to say, you know what? I know with just a word, I could end all of this. But I'm going to let it happen to me because I know this is God's plan. I know this is the only way to redeem them. So I'm going to keep my power with it. I'm not going to do anything about it. I think he showed, the, he showed true strength. And that he carried out God's plan. He stayed faithful in that plan. He stayed humble. He stayed obedient even to death. What happened is his willingness was as big as his want to. His willingness, Jesus' willingness, was as big as his want to. You say, what does that mean? I think as Christians, there's a lot of us that would at least mentally say, oh yeah, I'd really like to fill in the blank. I would really like to read the whole Bible this year. I would really like to have a better prayer life. I would really like to share the gospel with more people. You you and I, I'll put myself up there with you. Sometimes we have that want to, we say, oh, I'd really like to do that. But when we walk out the door, does our willingness to do the work Meet the want to. Do you follow? You, you have to be willing to put in the work. Uh, there's some, uh, one of the guys in our business group, uh, Shelby LaBeouf, Tim knows him. Shelby, I think he said he weighed, he's, he's probably only this tall, but he weighed over 300 pounds, I think he shared. He's a bigger guy. But he determined, there came a point, I don't remember what it was that sparked his story, but uh, he said there was a day where I just decided I'm tired of this. I'm tired of living like this. And he said, the first day, I ran a block, and that was all I could do. And I stopped, and I walked home. And the next day, I ran a block and a half. And it kept going and kept going. It's been three years 
Dude is ripped. I mean, he puts the buff in Shelby LaBeouf. What happened? He wanted to do something about it, and he was willing to put in the work. Uh, we get to put, do a presentation of, our, of what we do, and when he did his, I think he says he's at the gym at 4 o'clock in the morning, putting in work at the gorilla pit. I don't know where the gorilla pit is, but that's where he is. He's putting in the work, and he's changed his life because of that. His willingness met his want to. How much more important is it in our spiritual lives, those goals that we, we think of, those desires that we have for our Savior? We say we want to do them. But does your willingness to work match up with that? Examine yourself. Letter B. Regard not the stuff. Regard not the stuff. What what had been said is, I'm going to send, we're going to send carts down. But it didn't say, we're going to send carts up because it would have been moving north. It didn't say we're sending carts up so you can pack all your stuff in here. No, it says the carts are for your little ones and for the women. The famine was bad. Understand, people were dying every single day for lack of food. And so when they were making this plan, it was, hey, you need to be in a hurry to do this because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You need to be in a hurry to get down here, Dad. We have this plan. We set it in motion uh, so that we can save you. They sent the carts for people, but it said there in verse number 20, also, regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. He was saying, leave all that stuff behind in Canaan land because there's much better stuff here in Egypt. We'll take care of you. I think that sometimes as Christians, we get too involved with our stuff. We don't, we're, 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 we regard the stuff too much. Oh man, I got a brand new boat. This is what I, I'm all about, this new boat. I'm all about this new technology. I'm all about this new relationship or this, this new house or this new vehicle or whatever you want to put there, regard not the stuff. Don't think about the, the materialism that we have here in the States as, uh, as, as I plan to share later on with our young people, is do you love Jesus more or do you love the stuff more? You know, I plan on, in the young person's class, I plan on talking about you know, do you love video games more or do you love Jesus more? If you love, when it comes to salvation, I'm going to be speaking about an empty tomb. You know, do you, there's an empty tomb so you don't have to have an empty life. You know, and if you love anything, you say, I, I don't think I could, I could give up uh, my house for Jesus. Well, you can't be saved. I can't give up my relationship for Jesus. Well, you can't be saved. I can't give up my spouse or my, my kids for Jesus. Well, you can't be saved. You say, what in the world do you mean by that? As Jesus said, take up my cross and follow me. He's not asking us that we say, okay, faith, I'm done with you. So I can be, that's not what he's saying. But he's saying that we should love Christ above anything else. We should not regard the stuff. And the Bible says a a verse that uh, many of us are are well aware of is in Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to turn there is in Hebrews chapter 12. And that speaks to regarding the stuff. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, that's the stuff, and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Too many, uh, too many Christians spend way too much time caring about their stuff on earth. I... When and if the time ever comes that the Lord calls my, myself, our family, to pastor somewhere else or calls us into the mission field or whatever might happen, the wrong answer is to say, well, Lord, I really like my house. I can't go do that. Lord, I really like living in Peoria. I can't go do that. Lord, I really like serving at Crossroads, so I can't go do that. That would be a weight. That would be a sin. You say, how could... How could serving at Crossroads be a sin? Did you catch what I say? If God's calling me somewhere else to stay would be wrong. Uh, no, don't, don't worry if you were worried. I don't feel like he is. We're happy where we're at. So don't worry. I love, this is where God's called us to. Uh, but what I'm saying is sometimes good things are not 
the God thing. Okay? Sometimes we get fooled because we say, well, this is a good thing, but it's not what God's called you to. He's got something better for you over there. I've, I've been on a couple ministry pages, and some of those preachers or pastors will say, I am looking for a church in, I shared with pastor, I, um, I'm looking for a church in, in the area of Asheville, North Carolina. I'm looking to start a Baptist church in Asheville, North Carolina. Folks, I'm from North Carolina. There's 12 Baptist churches in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm just saying that I can think of other places that need a Baptist church, that need a gospel preaching church. And maybe if that's where God's calling somebody, okay, I'm not going to argue with God, but what I'm saying is I do find it, inter- I find it hard that people are limiting God to a geographical area. Don't limit God don't limit, don't limit God's call on your life. God had a plan for Joseph. He was faithful in the plan. Follow the plan. And that comes uh, with A. Um, we said with letter A, tell of my glory and then B, regard not the stuff. Don't let stuff hold you back. Don't let a location hold you back from following God's plan for you. Don't let uh, a person hold you back from following God's plan for you. Follow God's plan. Men, sometimes that, that means you being stubborn in God's will and saying, this is what God's calling us to. This is what I know is right. We're going to do this. Ladies, sometimes it's, it's being that tender oh, influence in the home and saying, I think that we've been doing a little, some things wrong, and this is the way the Lord's leading me. Happened recently in our house. I won't tell you all about everything that was going on, but my wife was saying, no, the Lord's been speaking to me about this. I think it's something we need to think about and pray about. That wasn't her trying to step up and saying, I'm the boss in this house and you better listen to me. No, she was just saying, hey, I, I'm trying to listen to the Lord and, and this is something that's been on my heart and mind and I just want to share it. You know, we need to work together in this thing. We need, to, don't, we need to be like a chain link that's together, not broken apart. We're not fighting each other. We're working together for God's glory. And that brings us to point number two. Focus together on the task. Focus together. Think about the Olympics. Uh, we just came through the Olympics. We're having a lot of uh, team competition. March Madness is going on. My team's already been kicked out. There's only two left, and I know some other folks whose team's been kicked out. But on a basketball team, there's players, and those players have to work together to win the basketball game. And that's where sometimes you see those uh, Cinderella teams is what they call them. The, the teams that come in that are not supposed to win, yet a lot of times they work together as a team to win the game, to beat that team that they weren't supposed to beat. Why did they do that? Because those guys pitched in and said, you know what? It doesn't matter if Joe scores 20 points and I score nothing. If the team wins, that's more important. You know, if, if he gets all the rebounds over here and I don't get to pad my stat sheet, that's okay, because we won the game. Uh, Christians, our, our name doesn't have to be published uh, in Sword of the Lord or Christianity Today or whatever is the, the thing that everybody's reading. Uh, are you known to the Lord Jesus Christ as a faithful servant? Has he said, hey, I know that James, is, he's faithful. He's going to follow me. What I tell him to do, he's going to do it. Can you put your name in there? Can you speak for yourself that way? Teamwork is essential for any group that wants to be successful. We need to work together to accomplish the task. Uh, One author observed, We live in an individualistic culture, but we are called to be people in relationship. I underline this. We are not called to be the persons of God, but the people of God. When we, when we link up and work together, we get more work done. We get more accomplished for God's glory. I've shared it before about the illustration of uh, that workhorse who, who can pull uh, X amount, uh, all those pounds by himself. You put another workhorse with them, and they can pull a whole lot more. But if you have a workhorse, two workhorses that have been raised together and have the same goal in mind, all of a sudden what they can accomplish uh, is multiplied is even greater than just having that stranger horse brought in. Why? Because they have the same goal in mind. 
they've been brought together as a team rather than just pulling two individuals together. Now, that, now they're working together. A synergy, I think, is what they, they term that. Uh, and that letter A, it requires humility. It requires humility. Joseph had said to his brothers, fall out not by the way. What was he saying is, hey, you have a task in mind. you got to stay a team. You know, there's all these brothers, he says, don't bicker with one another. The, the family's lives are at stake. Fall not out by the way. Don't start fighting against each other. Stick with it. Hey, church, we need to stick, <clears throat> we need to stick together. Fall out not by the way. <coughs> if... If uh, somebody is, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Miss Rachel because she does a lot of the decorating. If there's a lady who's tasked with decorating and she picks different curtains, other ladies, don't say, I don't like those curtains. I'm not coming back to this church. I know I'm saying something silly there, but that happens. That happens. I'm not coming back to that church because they put different paint on the walls and I don't like that. That church is too cold. That church is too hot. There's somebody in North Carolina, he's, he wouldn't come back to church because it was too cold in the auditorium. Now, I guess if you have health issues, maybe there's something there. This guy wasn't that guy. Uh, he could have definitely put a sweater on or something like that. Yeah, put a coat on. But he, you know, if you're looking for excuses, one excuse is as good as the next, I suppose. But church, let's stick together. Let's get this work done together. Let's accomplish much for God together. How do we do that? Is to stay humble and then let her be. Encourage others along the way. Encourage others along the way. Finally, the brothers showed up to Jacob with some encouragement. Joseph is alive. It shocked him. It said his heart fainted within himself. He probably sat back staggered with the truth. But then they encouraged him more. They showed the good things that he had sent up. And it was proof that, hey, he is alive. We're, we're proving this with this story. They actually had some encouragement. Well, guess what, Christian? We have people that we can encourage. We have the potential to influence others. Uh, in, our, in our homes, spouses, we can be the greatest source of encouragement or discouragement. You know, we need to build each other up. Christians here... Let's gather, to, let's be together on these. Let's encourage one another. Look for opportunities to encourage one another. I say look for it because we're going to see opportunities where we can be negative. They're just going to happen. And we don't even have to look for those. They'll find their way to us. Don't be a part of the negativity. Be positive. Be encouraging. That doesn't mean if there's a truth that needs to be pointed out that you can't point out the truth. Uh, if it's something that, you know, you say, well, that could be negative. Well, truth, you understand what I'm saying. There's times where truth needs to be pointed out and hopefully that person receives it well. But there's other times just in, in our Christian walk, we need to encourage. We need to encourage with that verse that we read, with that statement that we learned. We need to be an encouragement and we need to mentally make that effort. You say, well, these things, don't, they don't seem like a big deal to me. The, that word of encouragement, that handshake, that smile, you know, that doesn't seem like that big a deal to me. Well, it does to that person. You know, like that, that water right when you need it on a hot day, how it strengthens you and it makes you, you are able to keep going. That's like encouragement. People, you might think to yourself, well, that's not me. I don't really need all that. Everybody's not like you. You do need it. You might not admit you need it, but everybody else isn't like you. People need, need more than others. You get what I'm saying? Hopefully, hopefully you understand that. In conclusion, what have we learned from the life of Joseph? Don't be afraid or unwilling to work hard. Always stand up for what's right. Never compromise your convictions. Don't believe the lies of temptation. Keep a soft heart and a clear conscience to allow God to work in you. If you would like this list, I'd be happy to print it off for you at some point. Definitely. Honor God through times of trial and prosperity. Use your life to point others to God. Forgive others because God freely forgives you. And then last, 
Remember that God is always in control and trust that He always has your best interests at heart. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that we would think on the life of Joseph. We would remember what it is you have for us, Lord. Remember your plan is at work in our lives and help us to be followers of you. Lord, you've been so good to us. I pray you guide us today as we rejoice in your resurrection. Thank you for your great mercy to us. In Jesus' name.